thanks everybody for showing up and uh yeah it's kind of fun we're pushing on, on the series now and and actually this is the fourth one we've got our schedule lined out pretty much for the next six months i think talking about different technology but certainly willing to as chelsea said adjust it if there's things that you're particularly interested in i am going to kind of mention all the product lines that we deal with at the end of this just so you have an idea but um, again, I always like to start this off with thanking uh, Ms. Dalzell and ChelseaDalzell.com. They help to arrange this whole webinar series for us, to help us market it, and obviously to market, uh, moderate it and greet everybody, and she kind of softens the crowd for me, so I get to come on and do my thing when everybody's relaxed. Um, so yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, fuel optimization and the COSA 9610 uh, Wabi Index Analyzer. The, um, as Chelsea uh, mentioned, uh, this is a COSA Zentar project. So COSA has been around for a while. This uh, the COSA has been around for about 30 years and uh, has gone through a number of different methods of, of optimizing um, burner controls and things like that. So it's, it's kind of an interesting subject and of course very relevant as we look at uh, people concerned with energy efficiency and also concerned with operating efficiencies. Um, you know, a lot of in our industry, in the oil and gas industry, in the mining industries, we often start these meetings off with um, safety moments. And uh, we've taken the approach now with, with COVID that we actually, we've been trying to start all these off with a gratitude moment. And so I like to talk a little bit about people, customers, things that are going on that we're grateful for. And, and I did recognize my service manager last week, Nathan Ward. But I also just want to bring up this, my entire service group right now. We shipped a lot of stuff right before Christmas. And so we've got startups going on all over the place right now. And the whole service team has kind of jumped together to try to get this all this work going on. So I um, really want to put a, just a shout out to Nathan, to Doug, to Saul, to Louis, to Jessica, all of you for just uh, being there and helping support customers. All right, so the agenda for today. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about who Insight is, and then I'm gonna talk more about the COSA 9610, a Wabi Index Analyzer, Carry Analyzer, and kind of talk to a little bit on, you know, why bother, why do we do this? Um, principles, operations, what features and benefits are, and then some applications. So a little bit about us. Um, Inside Analytical is a Calgary-based systems integrator and distributor. We uh, operate on Northeast Calgary. have a fairly big shop available to us, 20,000 square feet on the production floor, nine bay doors, 10-ton overhead crane. can bring a full analyzer building straight into the building on the overhead crane. Um, we're, for the Canadian guys, it's important, but we're an AB83 compliant shop, so everything that we build has CRNs, Canadian registration numbers for Europeans is kind of like the equivalent of the pressure equipment directive. Um, we've done projects for Alberta, BC, Ontario, Saskatchewan with local CRN for all of those. A lot of the people here come from companies I've worked with in the past, especially the Western research side of things. And so they bring a lot of experience, a lot of great documentation skills. Our drafting guy has been doing analyzer projects and analyzer building drafting for probably 30 years or so. And so, you know, we just bring a lot of experience to this and put together a really good docs pack for our customers and for our service teams. One of the things that Jessica, who's on right now, has been working a lot, has just been putting documentation together with product that's going out. So it does get out in the field. Guys have an easier time starting up. Journeyman electricians, we do full factory acceptance tests right here in Calgary. On the systems integration side, you know, we have full systems integration capabilities, kind of no job too big or too small. You know, we'll do custom sample systems, process analyzer integration, starting right at the feed stage. We'll do full PLC and automation and full analyzer buildings, detailed engineering design, do the fabrication here, ship and install out in the field commissioning. And then of course, a big thing for us you know, the fastest growing team within the company is our service group because we want to make sure everything we put out in the field we can take care of and ensure it works in the way that our customers want it to. 
So that's kind of enough about us. Let's talk a little bit about lobby index. And first of all, I want to talk a bit about why do we even bother? Why do we care? What is it? So we want to be able to measure our combustion efficiencies. We get better efficiency, you know, from a chemist's perspective, we call it a stoichiometric burn, but from, we get better efficiencies if we use the right amount of air to consume the fuel. We don't want to use too much and we don't want to use too little. If we put in too much air, we're making that burner heat up a bunch of air, which doesn't necessarily do work for us. If we're using this as a, for a steam generator, um, we want to use that energy that's in the fuel to generate steam, not to heat up a bunch of excess air. And not only that, but if we, um, sorry, just got behind that video panel. There we go. Um, if we put too much air into the burner, we end up increasing the amount of NOx emissions that we create. And, um, and NOx is a you know, priority pollutant. It's, a, it's a, a monitored pollutant. We want to reduce ambient levels of NOx in the environment. And so we want to try to optimize that burner to keep our NOx emissions uh, as low as possible while getting the most energy out of the fuel. At the same time, if we don't put in enough air, if we have too much fuel for the amount of air there, if we run the burner rich on fuel, what happens is we don't burn all that fuel. So now we have higher volatile organic carbon emissions and we waste some energy. We've left some energy in that unburned fuel. So trying to hit that sweet spot where we can reduce um, the amount of unburned fuel, stay on the right side of that NOx curve, reduce CO emissions, all of that optimization saves us money on fuel, it improves the efficiency of our burn, and it reduces environmental emissions. So we have a good reason why we want to do this measurement. Helps us in, for other applications too, like on things like gas turbines, if we put too rich of a fuel in some types of gas turbines, we can end up getting the burner temperature too high. And if we do that, we can actually damage the turbine blades. So Again, there's a lot of economic value in being able to optimize how we uh, get that proper fuel to air ratio going into a burner so we get the most energy out, the least emissions, and the most power out of the thing. So if we're going to do that, there's a lot of things we could try and measure. Um, yeah, that, yeah, and Lee, yeah, the explosive hazards are running rich as well. I mean, we don't want to have all this unburned fuel, heat, and then it gets out and we've got some excess, excess oxygen there. So um, there's a lot of value in doing this. There's different ways we can look at do it, doing it. For things like stack gas emissions, we often just measure the amount of excess oxygen that's going out in the stack and as long as there's some excess O2 there, we say, well, we got a good burn and we probably burned all of the um, contaminants like sulfur or whatever, if it's a sulfur plant stack, we burn what we wanted to in the stack. But when we're trying to optimize an actual operating steam generator or a gas turbine, we want really fast response. We don't want to measure after the fact. Ideally, we want to measure before. We want to get a measurement or an idea of how, what should we set the air level at and do what we like to call as feed forward control, gives us faster response. So there's a couple of ways we can do that. Um, people have done it with gas chromatographs, but gas chromatographs usually aren't fast enough. People have started to put infrared spectrometers in there to try to look at the fuel composition but it misses things like hydrogen that may be part of the combustion process. And so one of the most accepted ways of doing it has been by measuring residual oxygen, by doing a controlled burn before it gets into the burner. And if we do that, what we can do on these types of analyzers is measure the heating value of the fluid this also is gonna require a density measurement. Um, we can measure relative density, the density of the gas as compared to air. We can measure what's referred to as carry, the combustion air requirement index, how much air is required to get 
exactly the right amount of air to burn this fuel. And then what we often end up controlling our burners off of is a thing called Wolby index. And it's related to the gross heating value, but it's divided by the square root of the relative density. And the reason this comes into play is, you know, often there's some kind of flow controlling device that goes, that controls uh, the flow of fuel and of air into the burner. And the air doesn't change composition, but when the fuel does, the amount of flow that goes through the orifice changes with the density of the fuel. So we want to know how many BTUs, how much energy is in the fuel, the, um, the heating value. And then we want to also know the density because that lets us go, how do I control how much air I'm going to need? Changes in the fuel density is going to change the fuel flow rate into the burner. And I need to, as well as change the heating value. So I need to adjust my burn air for the change in chemical composition and how, it's, how much air it needs to burn all that fuel and the change in flow rate that happens into the burner. So Wobi index is the control variable that best allows us to be able to do that. So one of the methods of doing it, and the one we were gonna, of course, talk about today is the COSA 9610. It's based on this residual oxygen measurement. We're gonna talk about how this residual oxygen measurement works. Properly calibrated, when it's calibrated around the types of fuels you're gonna be using, you can get very high precision, typically around 0.4% of reading. So you're gonna get within uh, quite an accurate number that's gonna tell you how much fuel you need for that burner. It can have, I missed a letter in here, this should be T90. Time to 90% response is around five seconds. So we can get this really fast measurement. We have to get a sample into it quickly, do the fast measurement, and that allows us to do what we call feed forward control on the burner. Adjust that airflow rate for the changes that are happening in the fuel. Some residual oxygen analyzers you have, an, have or have or more historically had an open flame. Um, the COSA does uses a, a high temperature furnace uh, running around 1,050 degrees C. There's no open flame there. It basically is a furnace oxidation of this fuel. And um, this has some safety advantage, certainly. Low maintenance, no moving parts, large measurement ranges, so we can cover a wide range of BTUs with appropriate calibration again. We can put in a dual range option in case you do fuel switching. And we can add in a bunch of uh, extra filtration and things for different types of fuels. If they have particulate loading to them, um, fines in them and things like that, we can add some uh, extra filtration for those. So on the measurement principle side of things, what we do is, uh, measure how much oxygen there is in the gas after combustion. So that's why we call it a residual oxygen measurement. The way we do that is we first might put in something like a specific gravity cell. We get that specific gravity of the fuel. It's so basically a densitometer. We bring in a uh, excess air, and we have a little heat exchanger there. So the fuel, the air, everything's gonna mix at constant temperature. This again controls our, our volumes of gas, nor helps us to normalize that volume of gas. So we know exactly what kind of mix we're gonna get. Also it controls the temperature because we're gonna allow this to flow, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the static mixer, but we allow this to go into a static mixing chamber where we use critical orifices to control the flow rate into the chamber. So the advantage of a critical orifice is, as long as the inlet pressure is sufficiently high compared to the outlet pressure, changes in the outlet pressure won't change our flow rates. So it gives us a really stable uh, flow. Is there a payback for using this instrument? Yeah, certainly it's, I mean, we're gonna talk a little bit about it, but we'll, like I said at the beginning, we're gonna get a bit more power out of the burner. We're going to make sure we have less environmental emissions. So if you're uh, 
involved in any kind of emissions trading, like NOx trading, as goes on prevalent in California, certainly, but all across the industries now. Uh, we're going to have lower environmental emissions of NOx, lower environmental of VOCs. And so all of those things impact um, the value that it brings. But more importantly, we protect our burners against damage, against possible flame outs, about, uh, and we get like I say, more efficiency, better steam generation, if we're using it for something like a steam generator on SAG-D. Bill, sorry to interrupt you. There's a question in the chat. Isn't that the one I was just... Is that the one you got? Yeah, oh, payback okay. on the instrument. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so there's a number of ways that this, this measurement uh, is important. It's really kind of most important to the operation of the burner because it allows them to quickly assess the interchangeabilities of fuels. So if we're doing things like, again, you know, at an operating gas plant or a refinery, and if we have a fuel gas, our fuel gas can change composition. Also, we may not always have enough fuel gas, and we may be looking at mixing that in with sales gas or pipeline quality natural gas. As those two mix together, we change the chemical composition of the stream and if we don't change the airflow rate to the burner in proportion to the changes that are going on, we end up running the burner off its optimum operating ratios. So if there's uh, gonna be a lot of variation in the fuel that we're putting into the burner, um, it's going to uh, require that we make some measurement of how we adjust the air in relation to it. I bring up a slide right towards the end about specific industries, but really it's anybody, again, who's using a variable fuel. So we see it in custody transfer. We see it in flare gas. We see it in burner controls for gas turbines. We see it in burner controls for steam generators. Anybody who's using a lot of fuel and wants to try to make sure they use it optimally. You know, when you're using a few million cubic feet a day or an hour of fuel, and you say, well, I can optimize performance by even one or 2%, it can add up to significant dollars over time. So if we knew exactly the fuel composition, if we knew it was methane, we know that we need to put in precisely twice as much oxygen molecules as we have methane molecules, and we could get a perfect burn of the methane. But the oxygen molecules don't come on their own. They're gonna come in, of course, with some nitrogen. So we have to add in the fact that there's some air in there. And then as the fuel change, you know, we think of natural gas as being methane, but it's not. It's methane with a bit of ethane, a bit of propane, a bit of butane. And those other components, as they change around, they're going to change what the optimum amount of air to add to the burner is. And that's where we use this measurement to say, based on the fuel changes, what's the optimum amount of air I should be running to the burner? So we do that by getting a really good mixture of the fuel in the air, heating it up, making this chemical reaction happen, and then measuring how much excess oxygen there is. So we put in a bit more oxygen than what we're gonna need. And we see how much is left over at the end. We'll see as we go through this a bit, how the amount of excess oxygen becomes related to how much air do I need? If I know how much I put in and I know how much was excess, it allows me to figure out, well, this is exactly the right amount I should be putting in at the actual burner. So the amount of excess oxygen we measure can be correlated to the heating values and the air requirements of this burner to make it run the best. Let's talk about this little guy, the static mixing chamber. And it's one of the things that COSA has done. The really one of the important things here is that we can really control flow rates well because we're gonna allow the gas that we wanna burn mix with air. We have to know precisely how much gas we're putting in. We have to be able to control how much air we're adding. And so we do this by going across critical orifices, orifici. Um, what they do is they, when you go across a critical orifice, if you have a small hole and you have a gas on this side, this is a gas, and the 
you have a pressure on the inlet side and a pressure on the outlet side. So then you have the, the side that that orifice is gonna vent to. For most gases that provided that P in over P out is greater than two. So if you're gonna vent at atmospheric at one bar absolute, Greg, it's that old computer you own. How you doing, Greg? Good to see you, man. Um, if you're, um, if you're going to vent to atmosphere at one bar absolute, um, as long as your inlet pressure is more than about two bar absolute or 30 PSI absolute, if you're venting at atmospheric 14 and a half PSI absolute, as long as your inlet's around 30 PSI, you'll get constant flow through that orifice, even if the downstream pressure changes a bit. So if this thing's venting to a flare header, and that flare pressure is changing. We just have to make sure we have enough pressure on the inlet that that pressure in over pressure out is greater than two is satisfied all the time. And we get sonic flow through the orifice, constant mass flow rates. Gives us an extremely stable way to make this mixture happen. And that is one of the important things that we need in order to optimize this type of measurement. If we get that stability, even as the fuels change composition, we can get this really broad range of measurement, get good mixing and get the right air ratios in there that we can actually go through and make the measurement as we need to. So we got this completely mixed and then we run it through this furnace. In the furnace, it takes whatever hydrocarbon is there. So hydrocarbons are like uh, ethane is, you know, C2H6. So we often refer to hydrocarbons as CNHM. There's a certain number of carbon molecules and a certain number of hydrogen molecules in them. We take that hydrocarbon and we add some amount of air. I put Z in here as my amount of air. How many moles of air we're putting for every mole of the hydrocarbon. And when we run it through that furnace at high temperatures, 1150 degrees C, these chemicals all react. The hydrocarbons react with the oxygen and the carbons in the hydrocarbons go to being CO2. The hydrogens in the hydrocarbons create water. The nitrogen doesn't change, it's unburned. And if we made sure that Z was big enough, if we make sure we've got excess air, more air than we need, what will happen will be, there'll be some leftover oxygen that didn't get consumed during the burning. And the amount of leftover high, uh, oxygen is related to NMM. If N, it's, it is related to N and M. Um, and so it tells us what a bit about what hydrocarbon composition was there. So we have this flameless combustion that goes on. We've got more air than we need. We consume all of the hydrocarbons. The reason we run the furnace so hot, sorry, this is supposed to be 1,050, not 1,150. Um, we run that furnace so hot so that we get complete combustion. And then the amount of residual oxygen that's left over gives us a measurement of kind of the average chemical structure of the hydrocarbon stream, how many carbons it has relative to how many hydrogens it has. And that becomes important to us because when we have that, we know there's a really great correlation between, this is heating value, sorry, the text is a bit small on the bottom, so I'm just gonna put this down here. This is heating value down here. This is air requirement or air required. So what it tells us is that if we know that it turns out this thing is somewhere between one carbon and two carbons, this fuel. We end up from that N and M thing, we know it's sitting right around here. 
it tells us what the net heating value is. It's maybe like, looks like about 1300 BTU. And it says it needs about 13 units of air for every mole of hydrocarbon I'm gonna put in the burner. So now if I'm measuring my flow rate into the burner, I know how much air to add. Whatever flow rate of fuel is going in, I add 13 times that much air. If it's a heavier hydrocarbon, and it ends up someplace up here, let's say, 2700 BTU fuel, we say, well, I got to add 27 units of air. It looks like there's 28 units of air for every mole of that fuel, or for every unit of that fuel that goes in. Put a cubic foot of that fuel in, I got to put 28 cubic feet of air in with it. So this measurement allows us to figure out how much air we need to add the burner to get the best burn of that fuel. The thing we're showing down here is just how the oxygen analyzer works. So the zirconia oxygen analyzer heats up a piece of ceramic zirconium, air on one side of it, the thing we want to measure on the other, it develops a voltage across it. So fairly simple measurement. By physically measuring the oxygen, we end up with a measurement of this combustion air requirement we build a calibration model around three specific standards, kind of the low end BTU of what we think the fuel is gonna look like, the high end BTU of what we think the fuel is gonna look like, and one in the middle. And we build calibration constants from that that lets us calibrate the Wabi index. So from the measurement of oxygen, we get to figure out how much air do I have to put in my burner? And that's the thing I wanna know. If I can run my burner with the optimum air to fuel ratio all the time, I'm getting the maximum energy out of my fuel. I'm not wasting any energy by heating too much air. I'm not wasting any energy by leaving unburned fuel there and I'm reducing my environmental emissions. So in the basic process of how this all goes together. We take this instrument air and sample gas, we combust it in an oven, that's operating. Put 1150 there again, but I swear it's 1050. Jess, can you check the temperature for me? Thank you. Um, if the combustion's lean, there'll be excess oxygen there. The zirconium oxide fuel cells measures that residual excess oxygen. Once we know that excess oxygen, we can calculate our combustion air requirements. The more residual oxygen it is, the lower the combustion air requirement. Um, and the higher the, uh, or less oxygen means it's got a higher combustion air requirement. Did you see That's that? That's interesting. You're on the question, yes? Yeah, I see that, yeah. I wonder if you can miniaturize your system and install it in a CNG uh, system. You kind of, we kind of do this in our cars already. So when you, that's a good question. It's actually, I love these because I end up having to think. So when you look at most internal combustion engine cars, you'll see there's an oxygen sensor in the exhaust, in the exhaust side of things. Um, I always see them, there's a, the one I always think of is the little Bosch ones because I know I've replaced them a bunch of times, but they put a, um, yeah, and most Zerg cells run at 800. I think they run this, the Zerg cell runs at 800, I think, but I think the oven runs a lot hotter. Um, but, and so uh, cars use a zirconium cell as the oxygen measurement thing, uh, device as well. And that's part of what they use for combustion control in the engine. When you, uh, you know, in the good old days, you had to uh, tune your carburetor a bit. But now when we do electronic fuel injection in that, they adjust the airflow into the engine by looking at what's happening at the oxygen sensor. So I would think that CNG vehicles are probably gonna have a zirconium oxygen sensor that's looking at the combusted fuel and using that measurement to optimize the burn in the CNG engine. What we're kind of creating here, if you like, in, if you think about this, yeah, this is fun. So if you think about this, the way it could be a car, right? I've got fuel coming in, the gas that I want to burn. I've got an air intake, like I had at my carburetor. 
when you think about, again, you know, I'll think about my old 66 Chevy Caprice, right? I have my carburetor sitting there. It's sitting on top of that intake manifold. And that intake manifold is where the air and the fuel are all going to mix together. That intake manifold is my, that's my static mixer. Oops, I don't show the static mixer over here. That's my, in this case, they show a heat exchanger, but that's where I get all this mixing going on. Actually, here's the mixing chamber right here. So my intake manifold um, is, my intake manifold is the static mixer. Mix the air and the fuel, get them really well mixed, and then put it into the engine and burn it, that's what happens in the furnace, right? So this is the, the furnace in this analyzer is my, that's my internal combustion engine. It burns the fuel oxygen mixture. And then we have an oxygen sensor at the backside to say, how well did you do on the burn? And can I tune the engine up a little bit and adjust your air to fuel ratio a bit? So that's really, there's actually, it's, I'm glad you asked that question because I've not thought about this like this, but this is kind of a, a great analogy to what this is doing is it's like an internal combustion engine mixing fuel and air and using an oxygen sensor at the back end to try to tune the engine performance. In this case, it's just we're using it to tune the engine of a great big burner before it gets there. And so, yes, we get an efficiency increase and the emissions decrease. So, they, um, there's an optimum place in the burn where you're going to get the least VOC emissions, the least carbon monoxide emissions, and the maximum, or and reduce your NOx emissions as well. And again, you know, if again, if we go back and we think about this from the the car analogy, we want our engine really well tuned because we get better gas mileage, and we get less emissions from the car puts less load on the catalytic converter, all that sort of stuff. It's exactly the same thing. I have, I'm running this big industrial burner and I go, I wanna make sure I use my fuel really well. The way I wanna do it is I wanna optimize my air to fuel ratio. And so I can do the same thing just on much bigger engines. Common applications where this goes. Any place where people are trying to optimize their fuel gas. So a lot of industries, whether it's the, uh, whether it's a refinery, whether it's an operating natural gas plant, whether it's a, a heavy oil recovery, they get what's called casing gas come back or gas, associated gas that comes back with oil. Those things all have varying compositions. And so they need different amounts of air you know, if we go back and look at this chart, if my composition moves from here to here, well, I need a different amount of air going to my burner. Good question about the hydrogen. I'm going to come right back to that one in a second, Lee. So, so as my fuel changes composition, I'm going to change how much air I need to put to the burner. So if I've got any place where I'm generating a fuel gas, it could be a biogas from fermentation. It could be, you know, methane off of landfill gas. Anything that has varying composition, I want to be able to measure that and optimize how my burner is running. So I can use this to do fuel gas optimizations. If I'm going to go to a flare stack, again, you know, depending on what I've got in my flare, the BTU of the fluid in my flare can change. And this is a common one where we do see hydrogen in the flare gas. And so if you've got a varying hydrogen concentration, there's two approaches. If it doesn't vary too much, if it only varies by about 10%, you can go back to these three calibration standards and try to bracket that hydrogen variation and make sure the analyzer is calibrated to work over those ranges. If you have really big variations in your hydrogen content, you can be 60% hydrogen one day, 10% the next day. You're gonna, we put in an additional sensor, either a thermal conductivity sensor or a microgas chromatograph, just to try to quantify that hydrogen better. 
So if your hydrogen is a relatively minor component of the gas composition, you can tune that out with calibration. But if you, um, if it's really varying a lot, if it's the primary fuel, you may have to add another sensor in to better quantify that hydrogen number. But these types of analyzers, if it's really stable, if it's always high, if it's, if it's um, like a, a place that's actually got a hydrogen plant that they're creating and they're using the hydrogen for fuel, um, if it's like 90% hydrogen most of the time, if it doesn't vary, then that's fine. We would just take it out with calibration. Gas turbines is another one, especially when we're mixing in different fuels. If we have two different fuels we're gonna to mix together and then put them in the turbine, the mixing ratio is gonna change the composition of the fuel and it's gonna change the combustion air requirement. So whenever we're blending gases and we wanna be able to figure out how much air do I now need to burn this? This is where a Wabi index analyzer comes into play. It allows you to stay at that optimum burn point. And again, you know, it may not seem like much to say, well, yeah, you're gonna improve your combustion efficiency and get, you can get 2% more power out of the engine. Well, when we're talking about you know, tens of thousands of horsepower, 2% is an extra couple hundred horsepower. And if you get that just by doing measurement, it's kind of like you make a one-time investment and you get it for free. So any place where we're also blending gases in and we want to find, the big thing for this is where there's blended gases, really. I guess that's the summary of this. You know, since we're here in Alberta, of course, one of the markets we always like to consider is, well, how do we use it in the industries that we commonly work with? And so one of the ones I wanted to specifically address is um, oil sands. So one of the primary methods of recovery now is something that we call SAG-D. Steam assisted gravity. I should have put a slide in about how SAG-D works, but I'll draw it. We end up with this formation underground that's got a mixture of sand and very heavy oil, like tar almost. Doesn't want to flow. So what we do is, so this is, I'm gonna draw it over here. Here's my mixture of, my black stuff is my tar that's all in there. I've got some sand and clay and that all mixed in with this and it doesn't flow. So what I do is I drill two well bores through it, one above the other. And into this top well bore, I put in high temperature steam. The high temperature steam melts the tar. It mixes in with the tarry, oily stuff, dilutes it a bit with water. It drains down through the formation into the lower well bore. So the, this guy melts the oil or the tarry stuff, the bitumen, and it ends up in this guy and we pump it out. So they recover this heavy oil and tar by pumping steam into the top well bore, making this, it's just like if your honey doesn't pour out of the jar, not you honey, but I mean the jar of honey. Um, if you got honey in the jar and it's thick, if you heat it up, it'll pour easily. So we do the same thing with this bitumen. It's thick and viscous, doesn't want to flow. So what we do is we put heat in with this high temperature steam, and then we recover it with a pump. Well, we have to make a lot of high temperature steam now. And we want to do that with the minimum of environmental emissions. So now, we want to make sure that burner runs really well. But when we do this, we also get some gas that comes back with this stuff. And we'd like to burn that gas too, but it's going to vary in composition. So when we get over to the steam generator, which is really you know, just a big, big boiler, just like we would have at a power plant, 
our fuel matrix is always changing. It depends on what kind of vapors have come back from the wellhead and how much uh, natural gas, sales gas we've blended in. So we take that lower quality fuel gas that comes back from the wells, we mix it with natural gas, and we're gonna run that into the burner. But now it's changing composition all the time. So now we want the Wabi index analyzer there to adjust to those changes in composition and try to optimize how much steam we make. We wanna burn the least amount of fuel to make the most amount of steam. So our solution to this customer issue is to measure the calor calorific value, measure how much energy is in the fuel, measure its density because that's gonna affect how it flows into the burner and use that to control the burner. We can also make reports back on quality. And they want their fuels getting, you got too much fuel gas in there, the fuel quality is not good enough. What it leads us to being able to do is get really stable control of these boilers and optimize our fuel use. And so it's really through this, this is where the economics comes back. If you think about it, the sales gas, they have to buy it. So they wanna use as little of the pipeline natural gas. Um, they wanna use as little of the pipeline natural gas as they can and blend in the fuel gas. But in doing that, that's gonna lead them to more variability. So we wanna optimize how much sales gas we put in, and then we wanna optimize how much work or useful energy we get out by burning it. And that's where our economics comes back. If there's a small amount of, sorry, if there's water vapor in the fuel, it's not an issue. If there's liquid water there, you're gonna wanna knock those liquid droplets out. Hydrocarbons aren't that soluble in water, but if we let water get in, the critical orifice works perfectly for gases. If we get water across there, if we get a drop of water come across and then the water goes into the furnace, that small droplet of water expands to make a lot of steam and it pushes a bunch of the other molecules out of the way. So it'll lower our, our overall oxygen demand when we've got liquid water that's flashing inside there. Bill, are you reading that? Yep, you got, everything. got it. Thanks, Charles. Um, nice to see you too, VJ. It's been a while. Um, high accuracy. We can typically get somewhere between 0.4 and 2%, depending on how much variability is in the composition. And again, going back to Lee's question earlier um, about how, you know, how much variability there is in the things like hydrogen. We got to really make sure. And so we have a whole um, uh, tool that we use to try to figure out what the optimum calibration standards are for a given expected range of, of uh, process fluids we're going to burn. Fast response, like we said, five seconds. Typically, we can go across a fairly large range, up to 3,000 BTUs. Um, repeatability of around 0.7 BTU on the same stream. And then compensation for things like if there's a lot of CO2 there, a lot of hydrogen there. CO2 just acts like a diluent, but the hydrogen is a fuel consumer as well. It just has a slightly different energy balance than things like methane do. It's available as a zone two device, so we can put it in a hazardous area. If there's low pressure fuels, we, and uh, we can use a pump to deliver samples. Heated lines to keep the conduct bustables and water from condensing on the lines over. Our oxygen sensor to measure the oxygen concentration of the sample before combustion. So if there's oxygen in your fuel, it's gonna bias our numbers. Because remember, we're looking for how much more oxygen we need to add. So we can add an oxygen sensor and say, well, how much oxygen's in the fuel? And that way we can get you to the right air demand for the burner. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's available, you know, they've, 
Uh, there's a number, quite a number of these installed. I'll get, bring that up in a minute. Um, and because of the number, large number of installs, we've addressed a lot of the issues that can come up in those installs. Things like oxygen and fuel, variable hydrogen concentrations. Um, you know, real-time burner controls, will be index, combustion air requirement index. So sometimes people use different numbers for the controls of their burner. If we do this all to improve burner performance and optimize fuel use, and I see I'm just getting to the end of my time, so I'm going to mention that. We'll get you guys a copy of these slides as well. Um, so that's kind of the you know where you can get more information about the product. From a customer base, you know, there's a, a list here of people who have multiple units installed. A lot of the major oils you'll see up there, Celanese, Chevron Phillips. Um, uh, I think Exxon Mobil's on here. Exxon Mobil's on there, Flint Hills, Plains Exploration. So quite a wide installed base out there. And like I say, this gets us into, not only that, there's a lot of people that aren't on the oil side, on the petrochemical side, on the chemical side. So multiple applications, mostly in large processing uh, facilities. Got to think about, you know, big burners and big plants. You know, airly key cogen plants, things like that. So that kind of wraps me up on this. Again, I'll be happy to answer any other questions at the end. Um, just want to mention, you know, we work with a number of other product lines, everything from, you know, Z gas, let's say, to do hydrocarbon and water dew point in natural gas, um, barbon analytical for process oxygen measurements in uh, liquids and gases. Hawk for level, for fiber optic uh, uh, measurement of pipeline and conveyor integrity. We do the JP3 near infrared analyzers, Mark Metrics Raman analyzers, Atom Instruments total sulfur analyzers. Lots of optical based analyzers. My background is I'm a spectroscopist, so I tend to I understand optical analyzers better. So I tend to gravitate towards the things that I know. As well, Insight makes a number of products for uh, sample system optimization from composite samplers to automated grab samplers to little things even like this where we just take a conventional valve, add a spring return handle to it so we have a dead man's handle. So if we say, well, I want to make sure nobody ever leaves this valve open, it's supposed to be manually operated and let go of, you know, we'll just mechanical design and say that's this is going to help make some of our sample systems better. Um, again, I'd like to acknowledge the people that helped make this all work. Um, Nathan and my whole service team, this should have been the whole service team here actually. Uh, again, just want to say how grateful I am that the team, people that work with me here take customer interests at heart. And if we have three guys all saying I need a startup on at the same time, this weekend they said, great, we're going to go up on the weekend and be ready to get this nailed and done. Our next webinar is going to be on February 11th. We're going to be talking about composite sampling and automated grab sampling. And uh, I always like to throw up this little slide at the end that's kind of animated, just runs through a bunch of the systems that we've built. I can say we have a pretty good design engineering team. I love the fact that we integrate stuff around products and make complete solutions for people. It's kind of what we do. And we're always looking for opportunities to do more of that with people uh, from small systems, like a little sample system to full analyzer buildings or custody transfer skids. Um, last picture that comes up here is one of my favorite because it has a whole bunch of our gear all over the inside of this great big building. And so two of our composite samplers, infrared analyzer, automated grab samplers, automated solvent flush, all inside of a great big analyzer building. And uh, that's kind of going to wrap me up. Um, if you need, oops, this should have been updated. Coming February 14th, sorry. Um, if you need any info, contact us. Scott's on, Scotty introduced himself in the first part. Uh, Chris as well, contact myself. All of our emails are there. Um, we'll probably get an email, you're gonna get an email out from us with the video recording of this presentation of the slide deck and probably our line card in there as well. And uh, if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to us.
Thanks so much for everybody's time.